Hello everyone. So today I want to talk to you about hydrogen and nuclear and how these two technologies can help um, reduce the carbon emissions from steel making. Now, the, both persons who are laughing uh, are, are the prime ministers of Finland and of Sweden. And the reason why I want to highlight these two countries is because they are really leading in these regards. They are showing us how we need to do this. So, yesterday I made another video about steel. Today I'm going to tell you about the solution. But I think that I failed to impress on people how important steel really is, and domestic steel in particular. So, Europe produces roughly 10% of all the steel that is produced in the world. China is 1 billion, the total amount is 1.8 billion, and Europe does 170 million tons of steel production. Now, steel is practically used in everything. I have here a picture of a hammer and some nails that's just a very uh, basic representation of what is what steel is used for but in the bigger picture here which is an air picture uh, an aerial photo taken from Rotterdam there you see a lot of uh, buildings you see ships uh, all of those uh, all of those things use steel uh, same goes for cars, you know, practically all cars are made out of steel, some are made out of aluminium, but steel is still the, the dominant uh, material that is being used to make cars, and if you want to produce cars domestically, you want to have domestically made steel. And finally, I mean, this, this is just... Uh, just some highlights what we use steel for here you have the, the Erasmus Br Bridge in Rotterdam over here you have a, a huge Marsk uh, container ship this one is probably built in South Korea uh, but it's it, it it's to to emphasize the fact that this thing is just one giant steel contraption over here on the the, the, the right picture that's where you see uh, pylons for windmills if you want to build windmills you're going to need tons and tons and tons of steel, uh, rail tracks, and over here tanks, because I think that geopolitical, um, you know, the geopolitical situation really calls for prudence and defense. So just a, a short recap to refresh your memory if you didn't see it already, but if you're new to this subject, uh, I, I'm going to uh, recap it for you. Uh, so the EU industry, uh, the EU steel industry faces high energy prices, uh, and that's because mainly, uh, mainly because of the gas crisis, but also because the Germans and the French and the people from Belgium, uh, and I believe, no, Spain not yet, uh, have closed nuclear power plants. The Swedes also closed a couple of nuclear power plants, Barsebeck. Uh, so, so uh, that basically made us more vulnerable to the gas crisis, which we just came out of. Uh, renewables, I mean, despite having invested trillions in renewables, uh, they did not manage to keep the prices low. And the EU industry, the EU steel industry, struggles with the EU ETS, the emission trading system. And the emission trading system is basically uh, allowing companies to emit carbon emissions, but to set a limit of how much emissions that they can emit. And if you go beyond the bar, beyond that what which is allowed to you, uh, you, you are going to have to pay a fine. And this is a, uh, a restrictive system where carbon pricing becomes more expensive and more expensive as each year goes by, while the allowance keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is a double-edged sword, really, because uh, fossil fuel electricity also uh, has to deal with these EU ETS uh, pressures. So, so if you have a a, a steel a, a steel uh, factory, you want to make steel in a blast furnace, uh, then you're getting uh, a, a then you have a double problem because you have to pay for the for the for the emissions from yourself, but you also have to pay for the emissions from uh, whatever power plant is giving you the electricity that you need to make steel. Now, traditional steel making uh, releases a lot of CO2, and the reason why it releases a lot of CO2 is 
quite simple. So we have uh, iron ore. Iron ore is basically a rusted form of iron. So you have Fe2O3, uh, you have two iron atoms, and you have three oxygen atoms. And in order to make steel, you have to remove these oxygen atoms. And to do this, you need a lot of heat and you need carbon atoms because these carbon, carbon atoms, basically they coax the, the oxygen atoms and, and they basically rip them off the iron atoms. And, and, and that's how you make steel. Uh, but the cheapest way to get all this heat is obviously the coal because all these steel uh, factories, they, were based, they also have their own coal uh, it's not a it's not a coal electricity plant, but it's a, a coal heat plant which is underneath underneath the blast furnace, and, and and this is basically where all the CO2 emissions come from. There's also some uh, CO2 emissions from uh, you know the coke the, the the coke that you put into the furnace in order to make sure that. Uh, the oxygen atoms leave the iron atoms alone, uh, but but in any case, uh, the coal is the problem. Now everybody talks a, a, a big green deal, uh, and I'm I'm saying here only one company actually does it, but the company will come in the next slide. Uh, this is actually the same mechanism uh, as what you see uh, people buying certif certificates of origin, for instance. Uh, the Dutch Railways does this. So the Dutch Railways claims that they are being powered by 100% wind. And the reason why they can make this claim is because they have an agreement with a couple of large wind farms, I believe in Denmark, maybe even in Sweden, in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and basically what they say is, okay, uh, we will buy a certificate of origin from you and, and what are... If you are producing electricity, we will buy every kilowatt hour of your electricity that is produced. And then they say, okay, now the trains run on wind. We see the same thing happening with nuclear at the moment, by the way, uh, with, with all the data centers that are right now basically, um, you know, making agreements with, uh, with energy companies and with nuclear energy vendors, nuclear technology vendors in order to say, okay, once you've built that nuclear power plant at whatever place it is, I will buy every kilowatt hour of electricity that is produced in that uh, nuclear power plant. Now, back to steel, green steel, you can find green steel everywhere. It, it works the same as with, uh, with, with the energy uh, green bonds and everything. But what you really want to have is zero carbon steel. Zero carbon steel is steel that was produced in a system that did not need coal to heat up and that did not need coke to coax the oxygen out of the uh, out of the um, iron atoms. So what you get is the following. So this here is the in, is the industrytransition.org website, the green steel tracker. And here you see that there are a lot of companies that produce steel, uh, only a couple of really large ones. And, and here you see, you know, the, these are all promises, basically. Uh, companies that say, okay, we want to build uh, a demonstration plant that is going to produce steel that is green. Uh, not necessarily zero carbon, uh, and what you can see here, this is a this is a matrix. Uh, you see scope one, two, and three emissions, which basically involves every emission uh, possible that has to do with the process of making the steel. Scope one and two is just uh, the emissions, the direct emissions, and the emissions that are, uh, con you know, uh, tied to, for instance, buying the steel and th those kinds of things. And you have scope not stated. But what you see is that before 2050, there is only a handful of companies that actually promise to do uh, carbon neutral steel uh, before 2050. SSAB is one of them. That's a Swedish uh, steel producer. Then you get Salzgitter, which is in Germany, is a German company, but it's still uh, owned by OsloMittal for a large uh, part. And then you have Tata Steel over here, uh, which is uh, which is an Indian company, and they own a steel uh, a steel uh, factory in the Netherlands, and I believe one in uh, the UK. So so before 2050, I mean it's it's not really uh, not really. Uh, 
they, they are not trying to to push each other out of the basket here. Uh, when you say carbon, that they have a carbon neutral target at 2050, so by 2050 we will be carbon neutral, then you get a lot more uh, companies that promise that, promise that these purple ones, those are the Chinese ones, um, and then finally after 2050. But in any case, what you see is that they're all a little bit hesitant. They don't know whether they really are going to make sure uh, that they can get carbon neutral uh, by 2050. So, Sweden and Finland. Uh, why do I think that Sweden and Finland are very interesting in this regard? So, first of all, we have that SSAB company. SSAB is basically a company that, that, that um, they, they, they make steel, uh, primary steel, um, and Vattenfall is a power company. So, these two companies together, they are basically uh, making sure that the first... Uh, zero carbon steel project in the world uh, gets done. So let's get to the website. Uh, so what they have done is they have basically, um, they, they have come up with this hybrid system or, or they call it hybrid. Let me, let me enlarge it a little bit so you can see uh, what it is. So still you have the iron ore, uh, you have a direct reduction uh, furnace over here where you, you basically put in hydrogen and the hydrogen then makes sure that the oxygen atoms disassociate from the iron atoms and that's how you uh, end up with purified iron which then gets put into another electric arc furnace where you can actually make steel. Now, this system is carbon free, which basically means that you don't use coal and you don't use coke in order to make sure uh, that you can get steel. But you also don't get uh, carbon steel uh, from this. Uh, from this project. Now, the other thing that I think is particularly interesting, and, and, and this is not mentioned on the on the slide right now, is that Finland and Sweden, they basically co-own as SSAB. Uh, let's see if we go to the website over here. Uh, let's see the shareholders. What you see, this is the SSAB website here. They say who has uh, majority shareholders, who are big share, shareholders of this company. And what you see is uh, all, all of this is probably, it, it, most of it, LKAB, LKAB is 100% uh, owned by the government of Sweden. And they have uh, a, a total of, of almost 11% in shares of this thing. Then you have the government of Finland, 6.5%. But when you go to the geographical distribu distribution, what you see is that almost 50% of the companies owned by Sweden, by Sweden uh, 80, or, or by uh, Swedish owners, including Sweden, 18.8% uh, is uh, owned by Finnish uh, owners, then you get some United States, Norway, Germany, and then there's like roughly 13, 14% ownership by others, you know, people who live in other companies, uh, other countries, whether it is India or uh, whatever, the Netherlands, I don't know, it's, it's not mentioned here. So going back to this uh, system, uh, again, how is zero carbon steel made? Uh, this is uh, another uh, diagram of how, what it looks like. So basically what you do is instead of uh, feeding it with coal and cokes, you feed it with hydrogen gas and you still need a lot of heat because that's the trick if you want to uh, remove those oxygen atoms from these iron atoms, you need to add a lot of heat. And if you add this hydrogen gas to the mix, what you get in the end is iron and water. And after that, after you have this iron, you basically put it in an electric arc furnace and then you make steel out of it. So this is something that is being pioneered by the Swedes at this moment. And, and that's something that I think is particularly interesting uh, because when you look at the, the, the whole map, uh, here are all the... Uh, the, the here are all the, the blast furnace locations in Europe and these blue uh, tick marks that I've put here in Sweden, those are the places where they are currently uh, building this zero carbon steel infrastructure. Over here they are going to build a steel mill. As you can see, construction is underway today uh, and it should be operational, I believe, by 2026. 
and over here this is the place where they are going to build their uh, their, their their hybrid uh, technology i believe that this what you can see over here is already uh, what they are building i don't know whether these are the actual plants uh, but if they want to be operational in 2026 uh, it stands to reason that a lot of it should have been built or is underway being built currently. And they're also going to uh, do, the similar, do a similar thing over here where they are also going to use this hybrid system in order to use hydrogen to produce steel instead of uh, what you can see down here, lots of coal. And that's the big problem with, with steel these days. So steel is responsible for a lot of uh, the carbon emissions that we have. And, and, and that's something that we really need to uh, work with, especially with, with, with the EU ETS being as restrictive as it is. Well, you know, once the news has tightened to such an extent that you can't make steel anymore, uh, basically what you get is that, you know, you either adapt or you die. And, and that's something that we really need to avoid in Europe. We really need to uh, make sure that all these co co all these companies uh, are going to adapt rather than die. Uh, so the potential cure for EU steel, and this is this is a little bit hard because you know most of the European steel industry is owned by ArcelorMittal, uh, the Mittal family, or from uh, India. And, and the question is what their uh, their vision is on steel production in Europe, whether they th see that it has a healthy future or whether they don't want to invest in it anymore. Uh, we see uh, stuff like that happening with Tata Steel in the Netherlands at this moment where they really need to start negotiations with the government in order to determine whether they actually want to continue making steel here or not. So we really, I mean... Uh, people people tend to say well it's going to be okay because the steel uh, the steel industry is too big to fail in Europe um, but the trouble is once it's gone it's gone and, and, and the question is whether you ever get the money the resources uh, the expertise to start up again that's the question we don't know now there's another uh, matter that we need to discuss about European steel production is that at this moment a lot of people are basically up in arms because uh, if you live near a steel factory, if you live near these blast furnaces, uh, then uh, generally speaking, the uh, people people experience health problems that live quite close to these these facilities. So. Uh, they probably need to, uh, to to start thinking about how they can clean this stuff up. And I think that uh, the hydrogen reduction model is a good way to go. Whether that actually uh, solves the problem, I don't know. But it, it, in any case, it is a way to make sure that the steel industry can uh, survive in Europe. So the Swedish model, when you ask me what is it, uh, basically it is uh, increasing your share of nuclear electricity uh, in your energy system because nuclear is the one uh, technology that can actually make, um, uh, ensure that you have a stable electricity price, that you have a, a stable, uh, that you have stable production of electricity uh, which you then can use to produce hydrogen for these uh, for these uh, steel production facilities. Uh, the trouble is with the renewables is that I believe that the, they are an economical dead end. And this is especially important because these lead to industrial atrophy. Atrophy, for those who don't know, who don't speak English, uh, I'm not a native English speaker. I, I think that is that is that is obvious to most people. Uh, industrial atrophy basically means that at some point, the the, the whole uh, economic uh, situation in which a certain industry is basically uh, it isn't conducive to it existing at all. Uh, and so, what what what? you know what what certain uh industries are going to do is they say okay you know what we can't we can't make any profit anymore it, it makes no sense to keep this plant open so we are going to shut it down it already happened to two aluminium factories in the netherlands i believe that it's also happening to an aluminium factory in germany 
and this is just these are high power users so they need a stable supply of electricity and and because of because they use so much power in order to produce aluminium it basically makes the business case for these aluminium factories in Europe unsustainable. And that's what I mean by industrial atrophy. So we are uh, on the verge of losing industrial capacity in Europe. Uh, we see it with the car industry in Germany. They are hurting as well at this moment. So that's a big problem. So if we add nuclear energy to the mix, that will not be a direct solution to all these economical problems that we face, but it will make the situation more conducive to uh, industrial growth in the future because we do invest in uh, stable electricity production. And the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen method of, uh, of, of making, making steel is something that I think is very interesting. Uh, SSAB uh, probably has the, the intellectual property, so working with SSAB is going to be necessary, or perhaps uh, ArcelorMittal or Tata Steel or ThyssenKrupp can develop their own process, but it seems that SSAB basically beat them to it. Uh, they're the first one over the finish. They are already building a facility that can do it. And that's that. Basically, that's the bottom line. Now, the only trouble that we have here is that because it is the first of a kind, uh, because no, nobody else does this at scale, uh, it is that you know we we ha we are at risk of seeing that the steel that comes out of this facility may be more expensive than you know is coming out of traditional uh, blast furnace operations. And, and, and that's the point where we need to be very careful because we are very, uh, you know, people really want to jump on hydrogen all the time. Either they, they hate it or they like it. And I, I guess that this video uh, comments down below uh, aren't going to be any different. Uh, so what I hope that we not, what I hope that we won't do is that we are going to judge this too harshly because maybe the, the steel coming out of it is too expensive. Uh, we really need to scale this process up to see what its true potential is. I do believe that this is the way forward because uh, we, we really do have to uh, get rid of coal in steel making if we want to you know, enact the change that we really need to enact because these carbon emissions that come from steel production, they are simply too high. And we need steel too much to simply say, okay, uh, you know, uh, the carbon emissions are high, but we, and we can't solve the problem. So let's just call, close the, the, the steel industry. Because that's the problem, that's the, that seems to be, that seems to be the way that we're headed right now. And that's something that we really want to avoid. And with that, you have reached the end of this video. Uh, if you want to uh, contribute to the growth of the channel, please leave a comment and a like. Uh, make sure that you subscribe and that you hit the bell if you want to have a notification whenever a new video comes up. And I want to thank my Patreon supporters for helping me uh, pay the bills in this uh, little household. And if you want to support the channel, please go to our Patreon page, which you can find down in the description of this video. Thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye.